Well, good morning, Grace Life. Happy 4th of July weekend. As you can see, we have been patriotic here, decorated the platform, and you'll see other decorations around. I am excited about um, 4th of July always because, one, we celebrate our independence. Obviously, there's a spiritual parallel here. Galatians 5 says it is for freedom that Christ died to make you free. And that's a beautiful reality. It's within the heart of every human being because we were designed for freedom. Now, we also learn that our freedom as humans is not the ability or the, the choice to do whatever we feel like we want. The real freedom of a human is the ability, the freedom to choose whom we will obey. Romans 6 teaches us that our freedom as believers is that we will be slaves to whomever we obey, either of sin resulting in death or of life, righteousness resulting in life. So our true freedom is not that we can just do whatever we feel. Our true freedom is being who we are and whose we are. So as you celebrate 4th of July, you can make your own spiritual parallels, but I think about that kind of stuff. I want to tell you that we had VBS this week, and it is no less than a major miracle that this room looks like it does. Um, this whole church building was transformed into a space odyssey. The theme was stellar, and I can tell you there were over 300 kids, over 150 volunteers. And the kids ministry and the youth ministry did an amazing job sharing Jesus with so many young kids. It was, it was just amazing to be a part of it, amazing to watch it. And I wish you could see the faces of these kids day in and day out as they would come in and Emily and Josh would do a skit and they would have a little theme that they would do and a, a, a something funny and fun for them. And just the, the looks on these kids' faces as each day they came in for VBS to see just how much Jesus' light can be shined. And I want to thank you for helping all the volunteers that participated. But I, I'm telling you, like at 8 o'clock Thursday evening, to see this place the way it was and to see it today like it is, is proof that there's a God. <laughs> we have been in our series, One in Christ. Last week we saw the theme of chapter 2 was this verse. A powerful verse, for he himself, Jesus, he is our peace. That peace is a person. And I know as human beings, we would like peace to be a feeling, but actually peace is not the, the presence of a certain feeling or the absence of certain feelings. It's not the presence of certain circumstances or the absence of those circumstances. Peace isn't even the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of Christ in us. He is our peace. And Isaiah told us he is the prince of peace. And then we saw that not only is the separation between God and man redeemed by Jesus, but the separation of man to man is also redeemed only by the cross of Jesus Christ. That all of the sin of separation and hatred and bigotry and faction and division, because it is the result of sin, it can only be redeemed by a savior. It cannot be redeemed by a political party or by a, a new leadership. It can only be redeemed by Jesus, who is our redeemer. 
And chapter 2 ended with this beautiful conclusion of Christ being our peace. And now, now ours has a specific context in chapter 2, talking about the peace specifically between Jew and Gentile, between Israel and the Gentiles. And it ended with this verse, to pick it up in context as we move into chapter 3. So then you are no longer strangers, talking to the Gentiles, this church in Ephesus. You are no longer strangers and aliens, But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom whom the whole building being fitted together is growing with a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. I mean, I just want you to imagine what it, what it ends with. This is the conclusion. This is the wrap-up of chapter 2 where Paul is telling and convincing these Ephesians and some Jews that in Christ, these two warring factions, worse than the Hatfields and McCoys. Did I, did I date myself? <laughs> worse than an, an Alabama fan and an LSU fan. These two warring groups are made one in Jesus Christ. And that that they're being built together as a dwelling place for the Lord himself. Which proves to us what we've known. The building that we are in today is really not the church. It's a local church building. But I'm telling you, if you'd have seen what I saw last week, this was anything but a sacred place in a sense. It's, It's a place where the church comes to. Church, ecclesia, it means called out ones. It's where the people who are called out from the world into Christ come together and worship together or do VBS together. This is just a facility that facilitates where the church worships. You are the church. And this is an amazing reality that we should never take for granted. We are the dwelling place of God. And now, Jew and Gentile alike, by faith in Christ, have the same inheritance That's radical. And maybe not in 2023 as we look back, but for them in that day, this was radical. This was crazy talk. These Gentiles can't even imagine being on the same level spiritual playing field as the Jews, and the Jews didn't want them there. And yet in Jesus Christ, they are the same. They are the same inheritance. They get the same inheritance. It's an answer to Jesus' priestly prayer in John 17. Jesus prayed for this. Look what he says. The glory which you, God, have given me, I have given to them that they may be one. This is the effective work of what Jesus prayed for. In them and you and me, and they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. I fully believe that the testimony of the church is weakened because the unity of the church is not not known. We're going to see that more in chapter 4, where Paul is going to tell us that we are to preserve the unity of the Spirit as we attain to the unity of faith. Meaning, in Christ, if somebody is a believer, no matter what their denominational affiliation is, no matter what else they may believe about that, if they believe in Jesus Christ and he resides in their heart, they have the Holy Spirit, they are in him and he is in them, then we have unity together as the body of Christ. Now, we will spend the rest of this lifetime attaining to a likeness in faith and believing some of the same things about that unity. But we are one in Christ, and this is what Jesus prayed for. And we see that Paul is telling these Ephesians, Jesus' prayer is answered by Jesus. Today, we'll look at the first half of chapter 3. We'll see that Paul is going to drive this point home. He's not done. He's going to summarize it because this is such a radical revelation for the Ephesians and for, for the Jews. You know this, the scars of division and hatred, they run deep. And it took some convincing that this was God's plan all along. It was going to be no little amount of ink and effort for Paul to to help these Ephesians understand they are really actually included. They have a seat at the table. That God is bigger than the isms of, of what Israel thought. God is bigger than what man's traditions say. God, through Jesus Christ, 
shows that he is the only way for there to be peace with God and for there to be peace with one another. And it's all through Jesus. The Jews thought that this separation from Gentiles was so necessary, so absolute, so right, so justifiable that any thought of including them into their spiritual journey was short of blasphemy. They, they didn't like it. It was a struggle. The, and, and, and rightfully so. This had been a mystery. We're going to see that. But now in Christ, this mystery has been revealed. And Paul is going to tell us what that mystery is. So let's look at the whole section. We'll read it together. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to read the whole section, then we'll come back and look at it in detail. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the administration of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before briefly, By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to mankind, as it has now been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, which for the ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and to the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulations in your behalf, since they are your glory. Father, this morning as we look at this section of your word to us, I pray that you would drive home this super important reality that in Christ Jesus and only in Christ Jesus, Or are we one? One with you in spirit and one with our fellow man who believe in that same spirit. Father, it is this testimony of your people, those indwelt by you, those called out ones, that the lost world who have yet to come to you, who may not know of you, Father, that they may see in your people, the church, this unity found only in Christ, and, Father, be drawn to that same unity. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want you to notice, first, that Paul says he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it, it, Paul's, uh, really, for this reason, is the start of a prayer that he's going to actually get to next week. He got to it in the letter, but we're going to get to it next week. For this reason, he, he's going to talk about a prayer, but he almost gets sidetracked here to reaffirm how important this is. But I want you to notice that he's saying that he's a prisoner of Christ. He he was accused by the Jews, but he's a prisoner of Christ. He he was arrested by Rome, and and he's going to spend five years in prison, two in Caesarea, and then the rest in Rome. And yet his mindset is not that he's a prisoner of the Jews or that he's a prisoner of Rome. He, he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. And it reveals to us a, a, a such important truth. There is power. There is freedom in our perspective. That there is something to be said for how we view our situation. You, you remember in chapter 1, it says that we might see with the eyes of our heart that these physical eyes that can see physical things can get duped by the physical things that they see. But when we see bigger picture, when we see with the eyes of our heart this internal desire that is consistent with God's, we can see the reality of an eternal perspective. Something bigger is going on. By sight, Paul would have had every right to see himself as a victim 
to see himself as wrongly accused, he was. To see himself as, as persecuted only. To see himself as afflicted. To see himself of, of no good use anymore now that he's under arrest. This missionary now locked up. But he realizes the truth that his freedom is not in his circumstances. His freedom is in Christ. And he sees a bigger picture. His situation isn't changing. He's going to end up dying in that Roman prison. But his perspective is that God is up to something. James 1 tells us that consider it all joy when you face various trials. It doesn't say that various trials bring joy. It doesn't say that various trials feel good. It says that your perspective, your mindset in various trials is to be joy. And the only way to do that is to know that there's something bigger than what's happening. There's a who behind this. Not causing the suffering, but using it for a purpose. And Paul understood this. He changed his mind about his situation. He looked through the lens of the eyes of his heart and to see with eyes of faith what God was up to. This is also relevant for us in daily living. Yes, we may not be a missionary. We may not be persecuted. Hopefully, we're not imprisoned. But daily, we face circumstances. We face situations in our lives where we get locked into a way of thinking about it. And all of a sudden, woe is me, and we're victims, and we seek for pity and attention and acceptance in the problem. And there, listen, there's nothing wrong with having feelings consoled at times. If somebody is hurting, if somebody is in that mind, hug them. There's nothing wrong with those feelings. But if we get locked into those feelings, determining what our perspective is supposed to be, all of a sudden we are not walking by faith, we are walking by feel. And we're all prone to do this at times. Chuck Swindoll says, life is about 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Think about that. Many of us have been through things in life where it doesn't feel like 10%. It feels like 150%. It's overwhelming. It can feel debilitating. But, but what, if, what if what God is saying is true? What if fighting through how we feel about something, what if what God is saying is actually true? But that, that our perspective can be such as Paul's. That even though the situation would say we are prisoners, actually this is all for God's sake. That these are not obstacles in his mind, these are opportunities. Pa Paul is in a prison, but his perspective is infused with God's purpose in that prison. Not his situation. He, he, Paul actually believed what he was inspired to write in Romans 8 when it says, For God causes all things to work together for good. It doesn't, don't stop there. It doesn't say God causes all things. God does not cause all things. There are things in this world that are not caused or desired by God. But God can take even those things and weave them together in his divine plan and use them for good in the believer's life. It was not right that Paul was wrongly accused. It was not right that he was wrongly imprisoned. It was not right that he was persecuted. That was all wrong. But God used the wrong in Paul's life in a bigger picture so that Paul had a different perspective. And, and you know what it did? I mean, look, look what he testifies in, in Philippians 2. Did I skip it? No, I just didn't put it. So I'll tell you what he says. He says, because of his imprisonment, that he, even the Roman guards are getting to hear about Jesus, and many of them are coming to faith. I, I mean, what a powerful idea that Paul is not being a victim while he's being victimized. He's actually being victorious in Christ, and he's sharing his faith while locked up. And those who were his enemies are hearing of his God and coming to faith in that God. Nothing, not even jail, could stop what, what God was doing in Paul's life. And we know Paul had a unique call. 
And I want to be careful here. But you, you know this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look how Paul describes his, his journey. He says, we are afflicted in every way. That This is Paul the, the believer. This is Paul the missionary. This is the apostle. And, and look what it says. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. This is all a mindset. The, the, the first part is what's happening. The part after the but is what he believes about it. Remember, to live life after the but is freedom. But God. He says, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. So let me, let me read it again. We are afflicted in every way. We are, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not despairing. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. In my life, I'm not a missionary. I'm not, I've not been on a journey like this, but this sounds like parenting. This sounds a lot like what I go through in parenting sometimes. Afflicted in every way. But not crushed. Do you see it's a perspective? He goes on to say, we're always caring about in the body of the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death, Paul says, death works in us so that life may work in you. Now, I want to be careful here that, that we don't superimpose our calling into Paul's calling. This was Paul's unique calling as a missionary. This is Paul's description of what he faced in those journeys. This is not necessarily everybody's calling. I, I, I really want to focus on the last part of this verse. Um, Verse 12, so death, Paul says, works in us. He's talking about the apostles, those who were sent out to preach the message against great hostility. He says, death works in us. We're facing death every day. I carry about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. I'm facing the reality of death every day as I'm sent out. This isn't Paul being morbid. This is Paul telling his story. But, but look what he says. Look at his perspective. So death works in us. I'm facing death. But it's for your benefit so that life may work in you. Do, do you see what he's saying? He's got a different perspective. And it, and it changes the heart of the, or the, the mind of the heart. So let me say it this way. Perspective doesn't change truth. But truth should change our perspective. You believing something or having a different mindset about something doesn't make something true. This is not a name it and claim it, a gab it and grab it type idea. This is not calling into existence something that isn't. That religious junk should be done away with. That's a, that's a usurping, that's actually a, some sort of undermining of this reality that if we believe the truth, our perspective changes. But your beliefs doesn't change, they don't change the truth and they don't make something true. But when we know something is true, it should change what we believe. It should change what we think. And it did for Paul. The truth is whatever circumstance you find yourself in, here's the truth. That this may not change your circumstance, but it'll certainly help you through it. Here's the truth. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you're not alone. You're not alone because the presence of Christ is in you. You're also not alone because you're probably not the only one that ever faced this circumstance. You're not abandoned. Sometimes we, we look at our our tough circumstances and we cry out to God and we go, God, where are you? As if, if, if God, if you were present, if I believed that you were really present, this wouldn't be happening. It, it is not the truth there that needs to change. It's my perspective that needs to come in line with the truth. God has never promised that his presence would be some magical formula for all of the difficulties of life to go away. God said that his presence would be the reality of how to face any of life's difficulties when they come our way. 
When we go through difficult situations, this is the truth. You're not thrown out or forgotten by God. This, this also isn't a, a, a time to see if God's writing the script, if he's, if he's making the score even. This, this isn't God paying you back for something you did 15 years ago when you were wondering, when is that ever going to happen? And now this, oh, there it is. God doesn't work like that. God loves you. The, the, the whole of the New Testament through the finished work of Christ is that if there's anything of your past that brings regret or guilt or shame or condemnation, that it was done away with and nailed to the cross and you have been totally, completely forgiven. So today's present situation is not somehow God making that right by paying you back. You're forgiven. It's time for the church to stop thinking that we're ill-equipped for whatever we're facing. Please, as I, as I was looking at this and studying this, I, I, kept, I kept thinking, oh gosh, sometimes when we talk about this truth and how great it is, it starts to sound like what the religious world talks about when it talks about positive thinking. This is not positive thinking. This is believing the truth. It just so happens that the truth is good. It's believing him. And it's time for the church to stop thinking in terms of our lack. Yes, we should be honest about how we feel. We should be vulnerable about our weaknesses. But please hear this truth. Your weakness is not the result only of what you lack, but it can be the reminder of where your strength comes from. When Paul recognized his weakness and he cried out to God that this thorn in his flesh would be taken away, 2 Corinthians 12, God said to Paul, hey, my son, my grace is sufficient for you. You want a situation to change. I understand that. There's nobody better than God in the person and work of Jesus Christ to understand wanting a situation change. Do you remember his cry in the garden before his death as he's sweating blood? And, and for whatever you are facing, none of us have faced or have, have had to risk what Jesus was about to risk. He gets you. He understands. And he lovingly, compassionately tells you, like he told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. You think that the biggest relief and rescue will be a change in your circumstance. And I'm telling you, there is a greater one than that, and it's my grace. It's sufficient for you. It's my grace. And it, it, it's perfected, I love this, in your weakness. My gosh, the church ought to embrace its weakness. It, it reminds us of the need of our design to be dependent. Little kids, infants. I mean, I, I was a crew leader at VBS. They were a little older, at least for VBS, but they're still pretty needy. Entering fifth grade, boys, I had 17 of them. They're weak. They don't think so. They were proving to each other all weak things they could do. Whether it was on the gaga ball pit or who could eat the most or who could win at a game. When we as the church think that we need to flex our muscle to show that we are independent, we're missing the point. Your strength is not in your independence. Your strength is in your dependence upon him, where his strength is made perfect in and through your weakness. This is why we can be vulnerable, should be vulnerable, about our weaknesses. It's why I made the sort of joke last week, I'm not really that good a pastor. I tell my kids that. Because if my strength is in my ability to be a pastor or a role I play, and you can put whatever role God has called you to in there, it's just as valuable, by the way, because you're the person of value. If we find our strength, our identity in that role, we will eventually be protecting what others see in us or, or how they see us in that role rather than just being real. 
And man, the community of God's people needs to be honest and real. We can be vulnerable, we can be weak, but we don't lack. His strength is perfected in our weakness. This is the great exchange we talk about all the time. Our weakness for his strength, our sin for his righteousness, our death for his life. Here, our weakness for his strength. We are told all over the Bible to set our mind to this reality. Be transformed by the renewing of our mind that he will keep in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on him. These are not linear mathematical equations. These are the dynamics of a relationship with the living God. Trust him. I was in an elective hour this morning, and Steve Kubitschek was talking about the, the faith of, of George Washington, and he, and he made a statement, I'm paraphrasing, but, but it fits right in line. He says, don't focus on how big your problems are, but focus on how big your God is. Perspective. It's true. We all face things. And this is not denial, and this is not burying our head in the sand. This is, this is weighing the reality of the temporal that we see and feel with the eternal that we don't see. And when you compare those two, you know what Corinthians says about that? This present momentary light affliction. Paul wrote it. It's in 2 Corinthians. It's in the same chapter where he talks about being persecuted. He says, this momentary light affliction, do we need to go back where I, was, where I was perplexed, I was afflicted, I was... He says, this momentary light affliction is not to even be compared to the eternal weight of glory. It's not even a comparison. Here's the truth. You have all that you need as you face life that comes at you. And it does come at you. Peter tells us we have everything we need for life and godliness. We are fully equipped as the saints of God because we have him. Paul says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, the weak one. Paul is honest about what has happened, but he's also believing the truth about who can do something with it. It's perspective. He goes on. That by the revelation, verses 3 through 5, there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief by referring to this when you read. You can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, but it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and his prophets in the spirit. By revelation, apocalypsis, this is what Paul is saying. This has been unveiled to him. This this truth of Jew and Gentile coming together in Jesus Christ. It, it was a mystery before, but it's unveiled to him. And Paul was not discipled by other apostles. He didn't walk physically with Jesus as Jesus has his ministry on earth. It was later that Paul becomes a believer and a minister and an apostle. Pa Paul was converted around 32 A.D., it, he, he spent three years in the, in the Arabian desert. He didn't consult with anybody but Jesus. It was Jesus who one-on-one -on -one discipled Paul into this mystery, into these realities. It was later that he went down to Jerusalem. He hangs out with Peter and James for a little bit. But, but do you know how long after his conversion to his first missionary journey? I think sometimes we look at Paul and we think, oh, he got it right away and that guy's on a boat and he's telling everybody. 14 years, 14 years from the, the day he was converted to when he set off on his first missionary journey. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't teaching and sharing in those 14 years. He was, but, but it was 14 years before God called him to go out like that. Maybe we could be patient with ourselves. Maybe it's okay to not catch it all right away and, and, and still be learning and growing. I mean, I think it's proof that that Paul had some unlearning to do. Have you ever noticed that when you learn the truth, you've got some unlearning of the, the lies to do? I mean, I used to believe I was a sinner saved by grace. And then, and then I don't know, 30, close to 30 years ago now, I'm at a retreat, and there's a guy there that was from Quail Ridge Bible Church named Frank Friedman teaching at the retreat, and he's telling me I'm not a sinner saved by grace. And I'm thinking, he's crazy. Just come home, or let me tell you the truth, 
Come home with me and you'll see. And he's telling me I'm a saint. I used to believe that God only forgave me if and when I confessed. I didn't know I was completely forgiven. And that actually confession to agree with God includes the idea that we're completely forgiven. Can you imagine if we rearranged what confession actually means biblically? It literally means to say the same word as God. Homo legeo. Say the same word as God. Guess what God says about your sins as a believer? They're gone. I will remember them no more. I won't bring them up. Why do we keep bringing up our sins in front of God with our prayers? He doesn't remember them anymore. He didn't forget them. That's a, that, that would be something he's, uh, that would be a weakness in God. He chooses to remember them no more, and he cast them as far as the east is from the west. When it comes to the believer's sin, it is over. It's not, it's not getting more over as you confess them. The moment you entered Christ and Christ entered you, he had forgiven them. Completely, totally, it's freedom. Many of us have unlearning to do. Many, I used to believe that, that God blessed me when I obeyed. But a few weeks ago, we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, it says that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. It has nothing to do with your obedience. Actually, it's the blessing of God that allows you to obey, which the Greek word is to listen under God. Maybe we should be listening under God that we have been completely blessed, that we are fully equipped. Paul says this was a mystery. He says he wrote about it in brief. We we saw it in chapter 1. He talked about it. We've seen it in other books. Paul has written about this mystery. But but now we see, like like any of us, we all like a good mystery, a suspense thriller, right? How many of you listen to true crime podcasts, right? We we love these things. Alfred Hitchcock, Sherlock Holmes. We love mysteries, but, but but we want them resolved. Yes? Well, Paul, God resolved this one. He says there there was a mystery and it was hidden from past generations, but it's revealed now. And it's really basic and really powerful. We'll never get over this profound truth. Look at it. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past generations and ages, but has now been manifested to his saints, his holy ones, to whom God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. The the mystery is that Christ would be in you. That you there is plural. It's not singular. It's not Christ in you specifically. It's Christ in you, you Colossians. Here it's Christ in you Ephesians, you Gentiles. Christ will be in you. This is the mystery. This is what was hidden from past generations. Israel didn't get this. They had been told about it. They had been, it had been prophesied, but it hadn't been fully unveiled yet for them. And in their own pride, they weren't going to see even what was prophesied. Colossians 2, maybe even more specific, look what it says, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth and comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. What's that mystery? Christ himself. There is no more mystery about this. I know we hear things like, well, God works in mysterious ways. Do, do you, uh, his ways are not our ways. You know the passage in Isaiah where it talks about that? Do you know what it's talking about? It's not talking about like mystical or magical things. It's not, yes, do I think we can figure God's ways? No, I don't think we figure God out. I don't think we're supposed to. Any more than a little kid is supposed to figure their parents out. Parents' job is just to keep telling the little kids the what for and the relationship. I'm not suggesting we figure God out. But when we, when we couch things that have been revealed and still couch them in mystery, suddenly we miss what's been revealed. Christ is the revelation of the mystery of God. That passage in Isaiah where it says that his ways are not our ways, he's different than us, it's talking about total forgiveness. It's talking about being forgiven, that God will forgive us. That's the mysterious thing. That's the way he works in ways that we don't. It's nothing mystical. 
this tells me that all the clues, all the foreshadowing, all the imagery, all the shadows, all the types that were there in the scriptures in the Old Testament, all that Israel had been given, they now find their reality in Christ. Only in Christ will all that make sense. If you focus on Israel and their history, and you look at the feasts, and you look at all the things that they celebrated, and all the things that they did, the sacrificial system, the ceremonial, and the civil laws, and all the observances, it, it, it amounts to absolutely nothing except knowledge if the mystery of Jesus doesn't get revealed. He's the one who makes the shadow substance. He brings substance to the shadow. He's the one that brings a reality to the ritual. He's the one that shows what it's all about. All of the Old Testament was pointing to what Jesus would do and who he was. And now we see Paul is telling us the mystery's been revealed. It's Christ. Man's problem could never be solved except that Christ would be revealed in the man. I used to love what Major Ian Thomas would say. He, he would say, why, why does a pen need ink in order to write? And then he, he would quickly say, don't complicate it. He says, because whoever designed a pen designed it such that it only functions in normality when there's ink in the pen. Why does a car need gas? Well, it doesn't now, only. Why does a car need fuel, whether it be gas or electricity, to run? Because whoever designed the car designed it in such a way that it needs that in order to function. Why do we need God? Don't complicate it. Because God, our designer, designed us in such a way that apart from him, we are completely dysfunctional. We're complete. Look at humanity as a whole. Look at what you see out there. This is the dysfunction that is the result of taking God out of the man or out of the woman. So what's the great mystery? What is, what is God's eternal purpose? Is to restore man to his original design and function by placing God back into the person. So what's the mystery that was hidden from past generations but now has been revealed? It's Christ in you. Hey Jew, it's not about going to the temple and sacrificing and getting covered with God and, and being okay for a season with God. It's about having God placed into you, dwelling within you. One in spirit. Hey, 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 Gentile, it's, it's, not about, it's not about following what Israel couldn't follow. It's about having Christ placed into you. This is what restores us to function. It, it's simple. We are obviously not going to get through the whole passage today. So I'll close by, by just sharing with you when we think about God's eternal purpose to glorify himself. And in the creation of mankind, he did this not because he was needy, not because he was lonely. I hear, I hear like, why did God create us? Oh, he was needy or he was, God doesn't need you. He doesn't need you to serve him. If God had kids for those kids to serve him, uh, he's still needing service. I mean, I didn't have kids for them to serve me. And, and they are fulfilling their calling. <laughs> God doesn't need you like that. He's not codependent. His heart was that he being love. By the way, it, he wasn't lonely. No, God was, has always been in relationship. He is a three-part whole. There's always been this unity and this love expressed through the Trinity, through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He didn't create us because he, they were lonely. It's because it's who he is in love. That this love would be shared and expressed beyond himself. And the impact of sin that separated man from God... There's only one way 
to be restored back to function. It's that this mystery that God would actually, only God comes up with a plan like this, that God would actually be the offer and the redeemer himself. And that he would then come to live and dwell within us, not just among us. That's why this building is not a place where you come and meet with God. This building is a place where Christ in you meets Christ in somebody else and you worship together. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which means, it's singular by the way, and it's a definite article from Colossians. It's not Christ in you, a hope of glory, as though there are others. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Next week we'll finish up and we'll see how Paul is going to go on to say the specific issue here is that the Jew and the Gentile become one. I want to encourage us as the body of Christ, even especially maybe because of our belief in terms of the new covenant, that we would never separate, that we would never, that we would never point a finger at those who don't believe that way. We, part of the joy of our journey is to help others attain to the unity of faith, but we should be doing that by preserving the unity we already have in the Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. Father, I thank you that it's only through the finished work of Jesus that any of this is possible. And Father, we are completely humbled when we think that your eternal purpose was not just to rescue us, not just to take us to heaven one day, not just to forgive us. Your eternal purpose was to come and make us your home. Father, may we be settled in this truth, knowing that the mystery has been revealed and it's Christ in us. We trust you in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.